What is going on, YouTube fam? It's your boy Tony Two Times, and we back with another episode of Hood Tales, man. Before I start, be sure to tap that like button. Definitely watch this video to the end to hear the full story and all the details in the case for all the day one fam. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning back in to another episode. If you're new to the channel and you're feeling the content, definitely feel free to subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you can be notified every time we drop a new video. I'm going to give y'all a little disclaimer. Try to keep up with the lingo. It's a lot of crazy information in this story. Y'all ain't slow, though. So let's get right into it. In this thing called life, we all know things can go left and get crazy real quick. Especially if you jump out your lifeline, you have chose to ride in, put on your signal, and switch lanes. You now put yourself in unfamiliar territory. And things can go real crazy and have drastic consequences. We all have been in a place mentally where we second and guess something, knowing it could all go bad. But as humans, our desires sometimes overpowers rational thinking, and we do it anyway. Some people survive the situation and keep it moving, but unfortunately, some do not. Backpage.com For years back in the day, was a site nevertheless people could find companionship on. I'm sure all my fellas out there listening already know what time it is. It was Instagram before IG and DMs. It gave you access to a lot of things. Businesses, jobs, but before it was shut down due to so many setups and crimes happening off the site, honestly, it was most known for women being able to pay to play, if y'all catch the lingo. But like I stated earlier, the site was deadly. And some situations turned bad when a lot of women on there had boyfriends or dudes that benefited off what they was doing, if you feel what I'm saying. And sometimes situations went real left when people met up. And on this episode of Hood Tales, we will be taking it to Detroit, Michigan to discuss the case of a Marine who turned chef, who got caught up and made a decision one night that turned fatal. According to sources, a man named Douglas Calhoun, known to family and friends as DJ, played a big part in his family and community. Earlier on, Douglas made up his mind to go serve his country and join the U.S. Marine Corps. But he always had another hidden talent and passion, cooking. Family stated he could go through the kitchen, grab random items, put the things together, and they come out tasteful and good. He just had a gift for food. And when the Marine came home, he decided to follow that passion and be a chef in the Detroit area. DJ didn't have any problems getting clientele because not only was the food good, he was stated to be very outgoing and always the life of the party. Before he knew it, DJ was a legit chef, known as Chef Doug. And with good food and a great personality, the business quickly took off. Chef Doug was catering weddings, exclusive events, shows, and more. Always known for being punctual, professional, and delivering quality food. Business was booming, known as a staple in the community and networking, and being good at what he did. Word eventually got out about Chef Doug's talents to other places and states. Things seemed to be going great for the man back in 2017 who at the time was 39 years old. Chef Doug was very family orientated. So when he didn't answer his sister's call one day, she felt like something could be wrong. On June 1st, 2017, the chef missed a big event. That's something he would never do. His best friend and business partner called Doug's sister after not being able to reach him for a period of time. He asked her, hey, hey, you talk to your brother because he missed a big catering gig for a comedy show, and the promoters were looking for him. She immediately stated, I'm going to contact him right now and call you right back. Doug's sister called the man a few times, and when he didn't pick up, she playfully texted her brother, stating, boy, you better call me as soon as you get this message. But her messages would be left unread. Allegedly, Chef Doug was fine and contacted his friend back later that night and stated he was home. They decided to link up and go out on the night of the town, turning up drinks, good food, and people stated as usual, Doug was the life of the party. But that was Thursday night. By Friday, 
no one could find the chef, and his sister went straight to the police to file a missing persons report. But it had to be 24 hours that passed. The next day, Chef Doug was supposed to fly to St. Louis to cater a wedding, but family got word he wasn't at the airport and didn't catch his flight. They panicked and became extremely concerned. They knew something wasn't right. Chef Doug built his reputation off never missing an event. With worry, the family went to technology and used OnStar on Doug's SUV to track down his car. It was located to a vacant lot, nowhere near the man's home, in a bad area of the city called Brightmoor. The car doors were open and things seemed strange. Strangers joined the family in the area and the search started for the chef, but to no avail. Doug's niece would make a fine when she found her uncle's online password and was able to access his bank account. And shockingly, his credit card was being used at multiple locations the man never went to. That was suspicious. So Detroit homicide detectives took on the case. A cash reward was put out to the community for information, but detectives followed leads and went to all the locations the chef's card was used at. A big break would come in while they was going through Doug's cell phone. Police saw at about four o'clock in the morning, he contacted the number, and after that, communication went blank. That number was a burner number, so at first, police had trouble tracking it until records showed a call to that number was made in the same neighborhood that the chef's car was found at by his phone. The number eventually was tracked to a business number affiliated with the website Backpage. The tapter spent days looking through call logs of local businesses to see if the mystery number contacted any businesses in the area. They got lucky when a pizza spot called Crazy Joe's Pizza recognized the number as someone who ordered food days earlier. They even gave detectives the address to the house they delivered the pizza to. Police went to the address and knocked on the door. A young lady opened up and detectives stated they had a few questions for her about a phone number associated with the home. They asked if she recognized Doug's number. She stated no. Detectives then asked, could you do me a favor, type this number in your phone and see if a contact pops up. She started looking worried. Then the young girl allegedly slammed the door in police face, but they wouldn't budge. Minutes later, she returned outside and agreed to go to the station for questioning. Police were trying to figure out who she was. She stated she moved in the home in April 2017 with her two-year-old baby and her boyfriend, a 27-year-old man named Trevon Bakersville. It was found out the young lady was only 17 years old, and upon searching up her boyfriend's name, police noticed he had warrants out for his arrest, which gave them probable cause to go back to the home and search without her permission. When they went back to the house, no one was home, but a warrant allowed them to get inside. They allegedly found blood on a mattress and other evidence relating to a violent crime taking place. While searching, the young lady returned home. She was in shock. Police were in there. Once they told her they knew something had happened, she agreed to go back to the station. After about seven hours, she allegedly admitted that Chef Doug was at the house on the morning of June 1st, 2017. She also stated he didn't make it out alive. The young lady stated, you might want to talk to my boyfriend. And since Trevon already had warrants, he was arrested. But when asked about the chef's disappearance, he refused to talk. DNA samples taken from the home confirmed blood found was Doug's but no body was in sight. The Tetris decided to go back and talk to the young lady while Trevon was locked up facing unrelated charges. In exchange for immunity, the young lady told everything. She stated about four o'clock in the morning on June 1st, Chef Doug contacted the back page ad and arranged to set up a date. When he came over, allegedly, he gave her $50 for certain events to take place. According to the young lady, he then asked for unprotected intercourse, but she declined. He then demanded his money back, 
but she declined, stating that ain't how this work. Little did he know, Trevon was in the other room and heard the whole thing. The man came out with a blick, according to the young lady. The chef and her boyfriend would start to argue back and forth about the money. When allegedly the chef told him to step outside, he turned around to walk out and was hit up all in the back and other places in the body. At this point, the young lady said her boyfriend then said, we got to get rid of the body. Scared, she agreed. She took police to the location while telling them the rest of the story. She stated they loaded Doug's body in a bin and drove to a vacant garage and rolled him to the back. The young lady stated she was forced to do back page by Trevon and get him all the money she earned. When she asked could she just get a regular job, he allegedly said, no, nah, that's not the move. With this information, the detectives would contact Chef Doug's family and they went to the location. And 37 days after he was reported missing, he was found exactly how the young lady stated. His family was in shock of how everything allegedly went down. Trevon, still in custody on unrelated charges, was then hit with first degree murder and trafficking. The young man stayed calm when his first charges were read until he heard trafficking. Then he looked confused. As the case made the trial, the state's key witness was the young woman. She took the stand and told the story once again. Stated Trevon made her start doing business at 16 years old. And when she would refuse, things would get physical. The young man kept a straight face the whole time. As Chef Doug's family watched in concern and listened to the young lady's accounts. Trevon was eventually found guilty and sentenced to 120 years in prison. The young lady got full immunity as was promised for her testimony. Doug's family was hurt and didn't feel sorry for her or Trevon, but his sister did state she could just be angry and that's why she didn't have any compassion at that time, which is understandable because she lost a brother. Rest in peace to Chef Doug. I send my prayers and condolences to the family. This is a tough one all around the board. I get the family's pain. The young girl was also a victim of Trevon as well, though. People lie about their age on sites like Backpage, so Chef Doug might have just made a bad decision that turned fatal. Sometimes we got to think about the outcome. Four in the morning in the trenches of Detroit, I definitely wouldn't have made that move. But human nature and desires made a man who had the world at his feet make a bad choice that ended all bad for him and his family. I hope they can find closure and peace one day. More of this story, think everything through, especially if you got things to lose. Doug had everything, and Trevon and Shorty had nothing. But that's usually how it goes. Don't switch lanes and put yourself in a position you are already past in life. Chef Doug made it just to put himself back on that level for a night of fun. So remember, we got to succeed not to fail, so we won't be just another hood tale. Man, crazy story all around the board, man. I send my prayers and condolences to the family. Rest in peace to Chef Doug. But there y'all have it. Y'all heard the story, man. Leave it in the comments. Definitely be respectful. You know, like I said, I had to, you know, rearrange my words. But y'all know what I mean. Y'all know exactly what happened. Let me know y'all thoughts on this situation. I appreciate you if you made it to the end, fam. This is another episode of Hood Tales. This your boy Tony Two Times. All love. I'm out. What's up, YouTube fam? It's your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and I'm back with another video. In this episode of Hood Tales, I'll be telling the story of Brianna Davis, a woman who snapped after she left her roommate and a friend stranded in downtown Atlanta. Before we get into this video, welcome if you're new here to our channel. Please feel free to subscribe, click that notification bell to get notified every time we upload. If you're rocking with the content, smash that like button, share this video with everyone you know, 
Make sure you watch until the end to hear the full story. All right, let's jump right into it. In the summer of 2016, 21 year old Charles Ruddison was a student at Georgia State University, whose main campus is located in the heart of downtown Atlanta. Charles was a business major working his way through college at a Publix distribution center. Reports say that Charles attended high school in Gwinnett County, Georgia. People who knew Charles described him as funny, introspective, and had a self-deprecating personality. It would appear that Charles took his relationship with his friends very seriously, especially since he didn't have many blood relatives in the area and relied on his friends for support. Reports reveal that Charles's Facebook page was filled with conversations about how he felt about his friendships, life, and how to be a better man. His post on August 20th, 2016 read, I really don't have family like that. So if I consider you my friend, to me, you are essentially my family member. So I may come off as a bit sensitive and harsh if I am feeling neglected and left out because you all really don't know how much you mean to me and it hurts that I'm not categorized as the same. Please understand that you are like the only family I really have and like most families, there will be arguments and periods of disagreements, but it would always be love no matter how inconsistent our relationship is. I just have these unrealistic expectations that people would think of me the same way I think of them. Before Charles Rudson's time at Georgia State, he also studied to become a writer at Georgia Southern University, where he actually wrote for the school paper. And at just 21, he was working with the mentoring group 100 Black Men of America. According to Charles's aunt, he had a lot going for him. Unfortunately, Charles's life would be cut short after a night out with his roommate turned horrifically volatile. Charles Ruddison met his roommate, 22-year-old Brianna Davis, on an online student housing board. The two shared an apartment on Boulder Crest Road in DeKalb County, Georgia. On August 27, 2016, Charles, Brianna, and her friend, who I'm going to refer to as Q, were all hanging out in downtown Atlanta. For some reason, Brianna decided to ditch her roommate and friend, leaving them stranded. Charles and Q had to catch a ride via a rideshare service back to Charles's and Brianna's apartment. Once Charles and Q got back to the apartment, things immediately took a turn for the worse. At around 3.45 a.m., Brianna called 911 to report that someone had been stabbed. When officers arrived at the Ashford East Apartments, they found 21-year-old Charles Ruddison lying unconscious on his back on the living room floor of the apartment he shared with Brianna. The weapon was in the kitchen sink still bloody, the reports say. Charles suffered from a puncture wound to the left side of his chest and was rushed to Grady Memorial Hospital where he sadly succumbed to his injuries. As the news spread, family and friends of Charles were shocked and heartbroken by the tragedy. Many of Charles's friends and classmates lamented his passing, leaving condolences and fond memories on his Facebook page. Charles's sister, who was very close to him, said it was harder to come to terms with his passing because of how brutal it was versus him losing his life to natural causes. Everyone who knew Charles was perplexed by his sudden loss. According to police reports, Brianna Davis told authorities she was going to call police because her roommate, Charles, tried to attack her. Brianna told DeKalb County Police that her friend Q and Charles were upset because she had left them downtown 
and they had to use a rideshare service to get back to the apartment. She went on to say that Charles came inside, he pushed her, causing her to fall. She then punctured Charles with an eight inch kitchen blade in his chest. However, according to Brianna's friend Q, who witnessed what happened, told the story a little differently. According to what Q told police, she said her and Charles walked into the apartment and Charles simply asked Brianna why she left them. At that instant, Brianna grabbed a pot of boiling water from the stove and threw it on Charles, according to the police report. Brianna then grabbed the blade and did the unthinkable. According to Q's account, it only took 20 seconds from the time she and Charles walked into the apartment to the moment when Charles was fatally wounded. Brianna Davis was arrested and was booked into a county jail charged with one count of murder. 10 months to the year of Charles's tragic slain, Brianna Davis pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter. A judge sentenced her to 20 years in prison. The prosecution allowed Brianna to plead to the lesser offense after extensive discussions with Charles's family. Charles's sister said she wished the years were longer, but felt as though at least she got punishment for what she had done. Even to this day, a motive for the heinous crime is still a mystery. Rest in peace to Charles Ruddison. May his light and legacy continue to live on through his relationships and the memories he shared with all who cared for him. My condolences to his family and loved ones. I am so sorry for your loss. No one is perfect, but Charles seemed to have a personality that one would cherish coming in contact with. I am baffled as to what could have caused Brianna Davis to lash out and take his life. The whole scenario just seems so unprovoked. She left them stranded, but yet she zaps out when they're upset at her and want answers as to why you ditched them and left them without a ride. Now, I have a theory that I could be completely wrong about, but here's my opinion. Brianna saw Charles as more than a roommate. There's no speculation or confirmation that they had something between them, but Brianna's actions kind of spew of a woman scorned. Maybe at their night out, Charles and Brianna's friend were vibing, even if it was just platonic, and she probably felt like the third wheel, which caused her to get in her feelings ditching them leaving them to have to figure out a way home. I believe she had thoughts on confronting Charles, followed through with it, and sadly took his life. I don't know if she knew her friend was also coming back to the apartment. In addition to a traumatic experience, her friend could have been harmed too. Luckily for her, that wasn't the case, and she was there to possibly shed light on what really happened that night. But that's just my opinion. These are not facts, okay? So tell me your thoughts on this heartbreaking story in the comments below. All right, fam, that's it for this episode of Hood Tales. Thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This is your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and I'm out. What's going on, YouTube fam? It's your boy Tony Two Times, and we back with another episode of Hood Tales, man. Before I start, be sure to tap that like button. Definitely watch this video to the end and hear the full story and all the details in the case. For all the day one fam, y'all already know it's all love. Thanks for tuning back in to another episode. If you're new to the channel and you're feeling the content, feel free to subscribe. Definitely hit that notification bell so you can be notified every time we drop a new video. 
Okay, I got a little disclaimer for y'all. These two individuals haven't been sentenced yet. They innocent and to proven otherwise. This a requested video, but let's get right into the story. Being a teenager is an exciting time in life. Everything seems so fresh. The world seems new to you, and life is way funner. Even going to the mall or a movie was lit back then. But as we get older, bills, responsibilities, and real problems kick in. That excitement fades little by little, to the point you have to pump yourself up to do the same things you used to love as a teenager. But like I tell both my daughters, that age is also important too. In developing, learning certain skills, like work ethic, nothing in life is free, or having discernment for people you hang with or associate yourself with. Them years can set the tone for your future. For example, my mother had me at 15, so of course all her dreams and goals came to a halt, and real life came in. I commend people that navigate through them high school years, make mistakes, learn from them, and go on to do great things. But some things either be too serious to the point of no return or can scar or traumatize a person to the point something that happened at 14 years old can still haunt them as a 40 year old person. Being young and bright eyed, we felt like we knew it all and had it all figured out. But in certain environments, life hits real hard. And nowadays, in some places, at about 15, you are considered grown. I remember growing up, I always wanted a big brother to help guide me through life. But what if your brother leads you astray? And unfortunately, some teens never get to the point of realizing their mistakes because they lose their life at an early age. And on this episode of Hood Tales, we will be taking it to Memphis 10 to discuss the case of a young man who lost his life at work, allegedly by the hands of an old friend and co-worker who was just 16 years old. According to sources, Back in 2021, at the time, 17-year-old Contario Servion was a high school student at Melrose in Memphis. The young man was said to be funny, hardworking, and family-orientated. Just like most inner-city teens, the young man was trying to navigate the streets, stay out of trouble, and find his way in life. After a few hiccups, Contario started to figure it out and wanted to be successful in life. He started going to church, volunteering, and city events, even meeting with pastors to come up with solutions about the crime in Memphis and things to keep kids out of the streets and out of trouble. He was building his character and faith up. And according to a former teacher, she knew the young man was special when one day she was going through something personal. She stated she didn't tell no one at the school and on lunch break, Contario came into her classroom and asked could he pray for her. His grandmother and grandfather would state the young man really got on his grind once he found out he had a child on the way and vowed to be a family man, make money, and provide for his seed. He would start cutting grass, raking yards, and doing odd jobs in the community while applying for more steady work. Eventually, he would land a gig at a Five Guys burger spot on Ridgeway Road in East Memphis. Things seemed to be falling in place for the young man now having a steady job. Allegedly, he had a co-worker, a 16-year-old young man named Dejamon Payne. The two were cool, according to sources, and both were trying to stay out the streets and make legit money. But somewhere in the mix, the two teens would start having problems with each other. It's not clear what the beef was about. Dejamon would eventually leave the job, and being that he was not working there anymore, you would think the beef was over. Having a kid on the way, Contario kept the job to make a way for his unborn child. But unfortunately, the team would not live to see the birth. Dejamon had an older brother, 19-year-old Xavion Payne. And allegedly, the young man felt like the beef with him and Contario was so serious to the point he asked his big brother for a blick and to take him up to the job one day. And on September 15th, 2021, Allegedly, the two brothers hopped in the whip and headed to the Five Guys restaurant. Contario was working that day and was doing closing shifts. As the brothers pulled up, they sat in the parking lot. Contario and another co-worker were taking out the trash for the night, getting ready to finish up. 
walked into the dumpster. When the car door opened, someone hopped out and opened fire before running back to the vehicle and taking off. Witnesses quickly called MPD, who responded to the scene at about 12.50 a.m. on 1315 Ridgeway Road. A young man was lying on the ground, suffering from two bullet wounds. He was rushed to Regional One Hospital, where unfortunately, he would not survive his injuries. The victim was identified as 17-year-old Contario Sevillan. As family received the news of the young man's passing, they were in shock. Police would start investigating the scene the next morning and find multiple shell casings. Cotario's co-worker who was with him that night said he heard about 15 to 20 shots. The young man's family was frustrated. Memphis police contacted them hours after he already passed away and waited so long to investigate the crime scene. They felt as though the important evidence would have been gone. Police kept talking to the young man's co-worker. He would state he thinks he recognized the shooter as a former co-worker, 16-year-old Dejamon Payne. The community and Cotario's friends and family will hold a celebration of life ceremony for the young man, where everyone spoke highly of him and stated they couldn't believe he lost his life while being at work. MPD had a suspect, but due to the age at first, they could not release his name and information to the public. They moved forward in the investigation and eventually picked up the two brothers for questioning. One of the two admitted they drove to the restaurant with a blick and shots went off. It was alleged that a juvenile jumped out the passenger seat and started shooting. Xavion confessed the blick was his, but he did not have a permit for it, and someone pointed him out as the driver. The 19-year-old was charged with facilitation of first-degree murder and gave a $150,000 bail. His little brother was held at a juvenile facility pending charges, but eventually he would be waived up and charged as an adult. And his charges ranged from first degree murder, attempt, handgun violations, and more. Once that happened, his name was released to the media. 16 year old Dejamon Payne. Cotario's family couldn't believe it and stated all three of the young men knew each other and were cool once upon a time. They didn't know what went wrong. Rest in peace to Contario. I send my deepest prayers and condolences to his family. As for the brothers, this case hasn't made the trial yet, and they are innocent until proven otherwise. It's sad the young man was on track to being a father and possibly somebody great in the community. And the end of his life comes down to a petty beef, allegedly. And kids taking out kids, not giving each other a chance to grow. And mature. It's not even fighting no more between young men. Everything got to go straight to the blicks. I hope one day we will wake up and see the vicious cycle and the setup we are up against. Losing our babies and women at childbirth, our young men and fathers to the streets or prison, our young girls either by jealous lovers or so-called friends. We are boxed in all around and everyone sees it but us. Until we change our mindset and the way we view each other, nothing will ever change. We always say how strong of a people we are, but are we really? When we can't even work out our problems in our own community and get our kids in the right mindset for the future. Hopefully one day, we really will be strong. So remember, we got to succeed not to fail, so we won't be just another hood tale. Man, rest in peace that young man. This was a tough story to get through. You feel me? 17 years old, got his first job, had a kid on the way. And I put myself in that mindset when I was 16, got my first job at Wendy's, had my daughter on the way. I had certain things going on in the streets and my life could have been took the same way, man. So when I do these stories, you know, even though I'm speaking present, I'm also speaking through experience and I feel the pain of the family. You feel me? And at the end of the day, man, the young man and them, who charged with the situation, you know, allegedly they knew each other. I don't know where it went wrong at, but at the end of the day, man, I'm going to leave it like this. They innocent until proven otherwise, but young man, we got to think about what we doing out here to each other, you know, because once you pour that blick out and decide to take a life, you can't take that back, man. But yeah, rest in peace to Contario. My prayers and condolences to his family. 
Y'all already know this is another episode of Hood Tales. Leave it in the comments. It's your boy Tony Two Times. Love, fam. I'm out. What's up, YouTube fam? It's your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and I'm back with another video. In this episode of Hood Tales, I'll be telling the story of a Detroit teen whose life was taken after a woman felt disrespected when he laughed at another man's comments about her body. Before we get into this video, welcome if you're new here to our channel. Please feel free to subscribe, click that notification bell to get notified every time we upload. If you're rocking with the content, smash that like button. Share this video with everyone you know. Make sure you watch until the end to hear the full story. Alright, let's jump right into it. On Friday, February 24th, 2017, in Detroit's West Side, 17-year-old Reginald Rose Robinson and his friend, who was also 17, were walking out of a store on the corner of Plymouth and Myers at about 6.20 p.m., according to news sources, when a black SUV drove past and someone inside began firing shots at the teens. Upon arrival, officers found the lifeless body of a young man in the street. One of the teens was fatally struck at least once. When medics arrived, he was pronounced deceased with a single wound to the head. The teen was later identified as Reginald Rose Robinson. He was a student at Cambridge High School in Garden City, which is about 20 minutes away from where he was slain. His friend was not harmed in the incident. Investigators sought out witnesses and two persons of interest from surveillance footage in order to find out who was responsible for the brazen slaying. They released photos of persons of interest who were in the store before the incident. They did not name them as suspects, but rather key witnesses to the crime. According to reports, a man in the store, who the teens didn't know, allegedly made a lewd comment about a woman who was also inside the store's backside. Reginald and his friend laughed at the alleged comment. When the woman heard them laughing, she thought one of them had made the comment. The woman and Reginald ended up getting into a heated exchange before she left the store. Investigators also wanted to find the dark SUV that was involved. According to news reports, investigators believed the woman had become upset and targeted the teens. Detroit police released video of the SUV they believed the shooter was in. Reginald's friend, who was there when the incident happened, told Local 4 News that the woman pulled a blick from the passenger side of the vehicle. He told the publication, she pulled a 9mm out of the window. I was right by the car, but she pointed past me and aimed and shot him, the friend said. He felled. It was thundering real loud. We heard the gunshot. We knew it was a real shot, but we didn't think anybody got hit. But when the young man looked toward Reginald, he realized his friend was hit. According to Reginald's mom, she wants her son to be remembered as a high school senior who had a free spirit and loved singing, dancing, and playing basketball. He was on his way to college in Arizona. Reginald's mother told the Detroit Free Press that Reginald planned to pursue a career in engineering. She said every day was a struggle for her and her family. They said they just didn't know why this happened to their son. There was no reason. It was just senseless. His mothers were completely distraught over the loss of their beloved son. 
days after the tragic incident, on March 1st, 2017, two women were arrested in connection to Reginald Slain. According to news reports, the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office charged 21-year-old Sharnia McCoy and 25-year-old Erica Osborne with first-degree hit and felony firearm. The two women were arraigned later that day. Investigators said Erica Osborne was the one who shot Reginald shortly after he had a heated exchange with the woman in the store, Shania McCoy. According to prosecutors, it was a drive-by shooting, with Sharnia behind the wheel and Erica armed in the passenger seat. The women showed absolutely no emotion during their arraignment. Their mugshots could also show their lack of concern for what they had been accused of doing. The two women were held without bond. Two weeks after the arraignment, Sharnia and Erica went before the judge for a preliminary examination. The hearing, which determined whether the case would go to trial, was pushed back until May 16, 2017, so Erica Osborne can first be evaluated by a doctor from the state Center for Forensic Psychiatry. Erica's attorney had requested she be evaluated for competency and criminal responsibility. Erica had claimed to not be in her right mind. Erica's mother said she always had mental health issues, but refused to take her medication. However, not everyone believed in Erica's incompetence. According to news reports, the investigation showed Erica Osborne and Sharnia McCoy allegedly shot Reginald because he laughed when someone made a comment about Sharnia's body. Reports said the woman took off running for days after the incident, which the family felt proved that the incompetence hearing was a waste of time. Their emotions weighed heavily after hearing the trial would be postponed until after the evaluation. Reginald's family felt like Erica and her defense were just trying to buy time. Erica Osborne's attorney also told reporters that his client was not in the store. The prosecution declined to comment until what they called the facts came out in court. Several months would go by before the case would make headlines again. In January 2018, both Sharnia McCoy and Erica Osborne pleaded guilty to second-degree hit charges in connection with Reginald's senseless slaying. In exchange for Erica Osborne's plea, who police said shot the victim, prosecutors recommended a judge sentence her to prison for 27 to 50 years. They recommended Sharnia McCoy, who drove Osborne as the heinous act was committed, to serve 16 to 40 years plus two years for a felony firearm charge. Both women, who each faced life in prison, were scheduled to be sentenced on February 7, 2018. During the sentencing hearing, Reginald's mother addressed both women individually. According to news reports, she said, This has been the longest 11 months and 7 days of my life. You were non-remorseful when you were arrested, she said. You talked about it in jail as if taking my son's life is a joke. Her voice shook as she told the women how she struggled with the loss of her son. She said every time she closed her eyes, she would see her son lying there. The women would give their apologies for what they had done before hearing their sentence. However, in my opinion, both women still lacked remorse. Sharnia McCoy and Erica Osborne were subsequently sentenced to the prosecutor's recommended sentences and are currently serving their time at the Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility, Michigan's only prison for women. 
fam, Reginald's passing was absolutely senseless. My sincerest and most heartfelt condolences to Reginald's family and loved ones. I hope they have closure and are coping with their loss as well as they can. I know some days may be better than others. I pray for their strength and endurance to make it through each day. This case happened five years ago, and we can see how highly emotional anger and irrational responses can cause someone to lose their life. Just because you're upset or offended at someone for laughing at you does not give you the right to shoot at someone resulting in taking their life. Sharnia had already left the store after the situation about the comment. She and her accomplice Erica could have kept it moving. They probably could have gotten over it as the day went on. But no, they literally left and came back shooting. The person that actually said the comment wasn't even the person that was targeted. Not saying that would have been any better, but Reginald and his friends weren't the ones. This young man was only a teenager doing teenager things like laughing at a joke with his friends and it turned fatal. I don't understand why these women didn't choose to let it go. I'm sure she has heard comments about her body before. So why fly off the deep end in this situation? It's just heartbreaking all around the board. Fam, please let me know your thoughts about this tragic story down in the comments below. I appreciate you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This is your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and I'm out. What's going on, YouTube fam? This your boy Tony Two Times, and we back with another episode of Hood Tales, man. Before I start, be sure to tap that like button. Definitely watch this video to the end to hear the full story and all the details in the case. For all my day one supporters, welcome back. Y'all already know it's all love. Thanks for tuning back in. If you're new to the fam and you're feeling the content, feel free to subscribe. Definitely tap that notification bell so you can be notified every time we drop a new video. Now, y'all pay close attention to this story. It's a lot of details, so keep up with me. Let's get right into it. Street life all over the world is pretty much the same. The only thing that might change coast to coast is the weather, the way people talk, the ways they choose to get money, or the reason for certain beefs. If we don't know nothing by now, we do know there's only two endings for real street dudes, prison or the graveyard. It's no pension, no signing bonus, none of that. Maybe just having a couple dollars and a name for yourself as somebody not to play with. But having a name in the streets can also backfire you on a person. If your name is always caught up in something, in your area or with the police. On another side of that, it's people that might grow up in a certain environment around street activity enough not to be considered green, but still don't know to what extent people will go to make an easy lick and a few dollars. And unfortunately, in certain neighborhoods, not knowing what's going on can make you a target and you could be looked at as an easy play. And when a blick is put in your face and a person tells you to kick it out, you never know who's behind that trigger and it can end up deadly. And on this episode of Hood Tales, we will be taking it to Lakeland, Florida to discuss a case of a robbery gone wrong leaving one man paralyzed and another with a life sentence. According to sources, Kahane Bennett had a name in the street at a young age. To the point, the way he carried himself and the things he got into earned him the nickname Cutthroat. Let's take it back before we get into the main story. Back in 2008, a man named Ernest Allen Jr. was gunned down during a robbery at his home auto repair shop on North Lincoln. The mechanic's case would go cold for years, 
as the family pleaded with the community. But the street code of silence was upheld for years. Fast forward to 2014 at a Chevron gas station on West Memorial Boulevard. A man named Jamal Fleming was with Kahim. Jamal, the passenger of the whip, got out to pump gas when allegedly a car came from the direction of North Brundle Avenue opening fire while the man was at the pump, unfortunately hitting Jamal, leaving him gone. But local police got tips the drive-by was meant for Kahim and not Jamal, stating there was a war going on and the other side was looking for Kahim, aka Cutthroat. Also, his name will pop up as a suspect in the 2008 hit of Ernest the Mechanic as well. Back then, he was only 15 years old, but the case would still remain unsolved. It was clear Cutthroat was a hot boy. Allegedly, more situations would occur that had his name in the mix, but with no hard evidence, Kahane will remain free. Then in 2015, according to sources, a man named Derek, a Lakeland resident, was enjoying Super Bowl Sunday on January 25th, 2015. Derek and his friends decided they wanted to turn up and buy some grass for the party. The group put their money together so they can grab a zip. And Derek agreed to go to the streets to go cop the smoke, in which he later referred to as the dumbest decision he ever made. While looking for a plug, Derek ended up on 5th Street in Lakeland, where he ran across a friend from high school, a young lady we will call D. It had been years since Derek at the time was 27. So the two decided they would go back to her house and chop it up, as he told her he was trying to buy an ounce. Once they got back to her home, not long after, a silver Dodge Charger pulled up to the curb. Derek, believing this was the plug and he was about to get good, approached the car. It was allegedly a few men in the whip, including Cutthroat. Derek didn't know the men, but they advised him to get in to cop the grass. He got to the back driver's side and tried to keep the door open and his foot on the curb, thinking it would be a quick buy. But the men quickly pulled off, telling Derek to shut the door. Allegedly, one of the men Asked him like, yo, you want to see what it looked like before throwing a bag in the back seat. Thinking it was grass, Derek looked inside before looking up to a Tech 9 being pointed at his stomach and someone stating, get him the money. Derek got into a fight or flight mode and decided to try his hand at getting away. He started fighting the man with the blick in the back seat with him grabbing the barrel of the gun and headbutting the man, holding it making him lose his grip. Growing up in a military family, Derek had knowledge of guns and had control of the blick as they fought for it. He tried to aim the gun to the floorboard of the car and shoot to unload it, but it clicked and it wouldn't shoot. Then he hit the safety and ejected the clip and it fell to the floorboard. Derek tried to keep fighting, but the other passengers started beating him. Outnumbered, he couldn't do nothing but get him the thousand dollars of cash he had on him. The man then regained possession of the gun and loaded it, as one of the passengers told Derek to get out the car and run, in which as soon as the door unlocked, the front passenger allegedly told the driver, bust him. Derek attempted to run away in a zigzag pattern, knowing bullets was about to come his way. He looked back and allegedly made eye contact with the driver and saw him fire before hitting the ground. And in his own words, everything in his body seemed to fall asleep and start tingling and blood was everywhere. The car took off. Before fading out, Derek was able to call police and then went unconscious. Officers responded to find Derek on the ground with a single nine millimeter shell next to him. He gave a description of the shooter and whipped and as a photo lineup was put in front of him, Derek pointed out the driver and the last shooter as Kahim, aka Cutthroat. Derek would go into surgery, but the bullet hit his spinal cord, leaving him paralyzed from the waist down. Five days after the robbery, police saw a silver Dodge driving and pulled it over. The driver was Kahim, 
he was arrested and interviewed, in which he told police he was in Leesburg the time of the shooting and didn't know Derek or anything about a robbery. But as an examination of his cell phone was done, records allegedly showed his phone pinged off phone towers in Lakeland and didn't hit in Leesburg until after the shooting. Investigation allegedly also showed Kahim testing friends, stating the only witnesses from the shooting was Derek and a young lady, D. With this information, he was taken into custody and charged with attempted murder, robbery, and armed kidnapping. Once in custody, allegedly, the street started talking. Now not in fear, witnesses and others in the community told police that Cutthroat was involved in hitting a mechanic back in 2008 when he was only 15, and he also was involved in the ongoing gang war in the area that eventually led to the gas station shooting and more. With that information, Kahin was charged with the cold case murder of Ernest on top of the new charges. As the case made the trial, it was assumed Kahim and another man did that to Ernest, but with all the time that went by in the case, he was acquitted. As the case involved Derek made it to trial, Derek now in a wheelchair testified about the day that changed his life forever and the mistakes he made. But Kahim's lawyer argued all the evidence was circumstantial and Derek wasn't in good condition when he told police Kahim was the shooter. But the prosecutors argued if that was the case, why would Kahim text his friends and know who the witnesses was? Also about why he lied about his alibi. He was eventually found guilty of the robbery and attempt and was sentenced to life in prison. As far as Derek, according to sources, after the incident, he fought hard to work on and regain his abilities and would go out of town to Kentucky for therapy. I'm not sure of his condition, if it remained the same or not. Rest in peace to all the people who lost their lives in this situation. I send my prayers and condolences to the families. More of this story, be careful who you trust. Stay in your lane, because one mistake could change your life forever. As far as cutthroat, he earned street fame and made a name for himself. But that same fear in the streets and fame ended him with a life sentence. I'm sure he would rather be a nobody out here in a free world. But now, it's too late. Don't waste time chasing street cred, because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter at all. So remember, we got to succeed not to fail. So we won't be just another hood tale. Man, crazy story, man. Salute to Lakeland, Florida. You know, I ended up going down there, you know, for some personal issues when I was trying to get my daughter. And, you know, she was living down there. So I'm familiar with the area. But, yeah, man, this whole situation was wild. Like I said, rest in peace to them young men who lost their life as well according to sources in this situation. And I probably will be covering stories of them in the future. But yeah, I ain't gonna talk y'all head off, man. Leave it in the comments. Let me know what you think. I definitely appreciate you if you made it to the end of the video. It's your boy Tony two times. This is another episode of Hood Tales. Love, fam. I'm out. Mm -hmm.